1st and 2nd Timothy. Now even though uh, this epistle is written to Timothy, who was a young preacher, who was, uh, as Paul will say here in just a moment, he was his son in the Lord, his spiritual son, because evidently he had won him uh, to the Lord and uh, out of Judaism. And um, trying to find my page here while I'm talking. Won him to the Lord, but he had helped raise him, discipled him in the things of God. Okay? So here's Timothy, and he'll mention here also in this chapter that um, he had left Timothy behind to pastor a group of people so that false teachers wouldn't come in. Okay? Uh, we have a lot of false teachers in our world today. Some of them are real plain to see. Others of them are sort of sheep and wool, or wolves in sheep's clothing. And we have to discern a pretty good bit to understand where they're coming from. And the best way to discern a false teacher is to know your Bible. Okay? To know the Word of God. To read it, to be in it continually. Uh, and to be discerning what God's saying and understanding the word, the principle of the word of God. I like I like to say it, who God is and how he thinks. Because God wants us to think the way he thinks. And Jesus came into this world and spent three and a half years ministering to show us uh, expressedly how God thinks in that dispensation, in that age, and in that time. Okay? And we bring that over to our age now. Now we do need good instructors and good teachers, but you need to pick those very carefully. Okay? Uh, had an experience when I was uh, uh, away from you last week. It was a very heart-wrenching experience for me. Uh, on Friday night, whenever I arrived there at my sister's and we were sitting around eating pizza and all, uh, one of my sisters got to talking about uh, some of her beliefs and people that she had been reading. She's a very studious lady. Uh, she's been a Sunday school teacher in uh, her churches that she'd attended for quite a while. She led women's groups. Uh, she worked with prisoners in, in uh, prison and uh, she taught them and she shared Christ while she was doing that. But she started talking about the things that um, she had been reading uh, the people that she had been listening to and uh, her ideas were way more liberal than you hear preached from this pulpit, okay? And so, and it's all that she has been hearing and reading and listening to Bible teachers. And what she's been learning from them is that homosexuality is not a sin, you know. And uh, several other things that come in here, you know. And a lot of the liberal things that we have today, you know. And you know yourself that there are a lot of people out here that claim to be Christians and yet they think it's okay to abort babies. Folks, that's a sin against Almighty God. And the Bible teaches that that's a sin against Almighty God. But there are false teachers out here that will share different, okay? And they sort of muddy it up, muddy the waters, and let things melt together. And God said that's the way it would be even more so as the end approached, okay? This world is preparing for the Antichrist right now. We're down, they've been preparing for years. Things have been happening and coming about in our lifetime. Remember Bob Harrington and Madeline Murray O'Hare? Did they stop in here and have their debate? They did down in Roanoke when we were down there and I went to it and just see what it was all about. And Madeline Murray O'Hare stood on the, on the uh, podium up there, the stage, and she took a Gideon Bible that she took out of the motel and she started ripping pages out of it and throwing them aside, you know. You know, she was an atheist, you know. And she didn't believe that there was a God. And she uh, debated on that side. And then Bob Harrington, who was the chaplain of Bourbon Street. Uh, Y'all know who I'm talking about here? He was a, a street evangelist, basically, down in Louisiana, down New Orleans, in that area down there. 
uh, he slipped and he faltered and he had feet of clay there for a little bit but uh, towards the end but he was deb debating her on stage and that was the beginning of it back there you know we, we come in our lifetime You're, you, a lot of us can remember when we went to school we'd stand up in the morning even when I was in junior high school we would stand up and put our hands on our chest and we'd say a pledge of allegiance to the flag and we would have a time of prayer somebody come on over the loudspeaker and they would have prayer to get us started off in the morning and in our time that's been taken away it's gotten away we're up to the point right now and you see that I've had several things on the overhead here if you've been reading it about our children are under fire okay today our young people in our schools they're having in some places I hope it's not here yet I hadn't heard of it uh, transvestites coming in and reading stories to children passing it off that it's okay teaching our children things like you know well you, you, you if you're a little boy and you really think you're a girl that's okay you can be that or if you don't think you're anything that's okay too and I uh, heard over the weekend as we were talking and sharing a little bit I uh, forget uh, the, the uh, name they're using but it, it's a gender that is okay with everything you know you, you can interact sexually with anything and everything in the world and that's all right and they've got a name for that now and they're calling it a separate gender okay we are under fire and our kids are under fire in what they're learning in the schools if they're going to public schools okay so we need to be very very careful I uh, applaud uh, my daughter-in-law uh, she homeschools her children and folks that's what we're coming down to that's what we're almost getting in where we need to now there's good Christian schools out here and there's good ways to do it but our kids are being bombarded okay I noticed it here several years ago working with teenagers in our area here uh, a lot of the kids that you guys know if I'd call their name that were in our youth group uh, either came through foster programs in our house over here or they were friends of the foster kids and they were came to our youth group and all well they could I mean they'll come out and tell you I'll talk to them and me I'd have been ashamed to say anywhere near this to a preacher when I was a teenager but oh I'm bisexual they're sinners amen why because this word teaches it okay there is a mass flooding of false teaching about the Bible, about God in the world today. And as I told my sisters, and whenever I shared with them on Sunday morning, I told them, I said, since we were home 40, 50 years ago in, in mom and dad's house and we were growing up together, we kind of went different ways. We, we think differently on a lot of things, you know the way we live our life, the way we raised our kids, uh, you know, spiritual things. But I warned the girls, make sure that you know the Word of God by way of the Holy Spirit who speaks to us, every one of us read your Bible, know your Bible, don't take any man just at face value and that goes for me here too don't take me at face value don't accept what I say just because I study the Bible a lot and you trust me that's good I hope you do you know and I try with all that is within me to give you the basic truth of the Bible I agonize over it because I know as the scripture said and as God said through Paul be not many of you masters or meaning teachers or preachers for there will be a greater condemnation God will hold me to a, a higher point of judgment because of the office that I hold in this church 
because I stand here as I do every Sunday morning and preach to you from the Word of God. He's not only going to hold me accountable for how I lived and what I believe that the Bible said to me, but for what I taught you and how I led you and how I directed you. I understand that. But all of us need to have the understanding of the Word of God and be careful who we listen to, okay? The Bible tells us that there are ways you can discern. Number one is you try their fruits, okay? How do they live? How do they act? Are they living what God says, you know? Also, are they preaching from the Word in context, okay? In context. Not just picking a phrase out, you know, and just using that verse and building something upon it. Now, this is, and this is all leading up to introduction. That's where Paul is when he's talking to Timothy here. In chapter 1, he's going to go through first an introduction uh, as he says, hello, how you doing? We started out with, uh, dear Renee, how are you today? I'm fine. Things have been going well in my life, you know. Uh, but he takes it out and he gives a lot of biblical truth whenever he's doing that introduction. And then he lays the groundwork for where he's going to go throughout the epistle and throughout the letter. Read with me in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Paul states, I am an apostle. Now, I didn't say I'm a disciple of God. He said I'm an apostle of God. That means that I was trained directly by Jesus Christ. I have seen the risen Christ, and he trained me. Okay? You say, well, Paul didn't walk with Christ in this world. When did Paul see Christ? You know, on the road to Damascus. He showed himself to it. And he took him away from the world he was living in for a period of time and trained him in, in uh, Asia, okay? Under Timothy, notice what he says here, my own son in the faith. Now I'm going to derive from that whenever I have people that God brings in to this church into the realm of my influence that you, you folks, you're not just individuals, other families, friends. You're, you're not just God's family here. Since God put me in this position and called me to this position, and he's called you to attend this church, you folks become my offspring in Christ. Even if I didn't lead you to Christ, I'm responsible for you like you were responsible for your children growing up and your grandchildren right now. And I need to take that very seriously. Now that goes on to you too. You are responsible for those that God brings into your realm of influence that you are discipling. And folks, don't be fooled. Don't be misled. Every one of you, as am I, are discipling people throughout our life. What we're discipling them uh, for and through and about is what the crucifix of the, of the uh, lever here is. Are you discipling them after the will and the way of God? Or are you discipling after the will and the way of the world? Okay? That's why God says that we are to be a peculiar people. That word peculiar means what? Different. Different. Than, than what? Than the world around us. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Who's the prince of the power of the air in this world? Satan. God is not dictating everything that happens in this world. He allows it. 
He helps the Christian in their life if they'll live for him and close to him. He helps us do the things. He gives us the power, the understanding, everything we need to do it. But he does not dictate everything that goes on in this world. Now, folks, when we get to heaven, that's going to be the heavenly kingdom. God the Father is going to sit on his throne. Jesus Christ is going to sit on his throne. And they, through the Holy Spirit, our triune God, one God, will rule justly in heaven. Everything will be God's way. There will be no sin, no, no, uh, 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 what am I trying to say here? Nothing anti-God. No sin whatsoever, no wrongdoing, no ill feelings, no sassing back and forth, no getting our feelings hurt from someone else because it's going to be ruled under the perfect will of God. And we will be back like Adam was before the fall. We won't even think about doing something outside of what God tells us to do. Our thought is going to be what we were talking about in Sunday school, worshiping God bringing glory to his name in all we do and say. We are discipling the people that God brings into your life. You are. So they are your children. My own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee, Still at Ephesus when I went into, to, uh, to abide, still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou sh mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. It is our responsibility to know the word of God and fight false doctrine wherever it arises. Now folks, whenever I was with my sisters, we didn't get mad. Nobody got mad at each other, but I fought. I fought with the word of God and said, this is what God says. You better make sure that you're discerning the word of God the way it should be. And I reminded them, I want to remind you folks, how do we know the word of God? How do we hear it? God speaks to us always through the Holy Spirit because that's our connection to God. By the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, through prayer, through circumstance, and through other Christians, whether it be preachers, teachers, or our co-laborers in Christ. That's the way He speaks to us. And if we will listen and if we will hear, we can know the truth. And folks, the truth will set you free, right? We can know the truth of the Word of God. And whenever we hear things that are not truth, we need to combat it where we can. And we can do it as the book of Galatians said. If you see a brother in a fault, go to him in meekness and fear. Meekness, don't go in there and, you know, beat him over the head with your Bible and tell him where he's wrong and all that. But reprove him with the word of God, with the love of God, and with fear that you do not fall into the same trap that they're in. Okay? That's what Paul's telling Timothy here. That's what I'm sharing with you, and that's what God has for us to remember. False doctrine, false teaching. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. And then he says, so do. There is a lot of false things going on in this world and going around. And you don't know and I don't know what to believe by way of the news and the media and our politicians and even some preachers in the world today. We don't know what to believe, do we? Well, how do we discern what we do believe and what we don't believe? See, the Word of God, the Bible. Know it. Live it. Understand it. Know who God is. How do I know Him? By studying, reading, and letting the Holy Spirit give me the principles of God and me living by those principles. Okay? Don't let them fool you. Don't let them take you out. 
Don't let them tell you that, you know, well, that, that little thing that's within your belly there is just a glob of, uh, of cells and a blob. No, that's a person. God, through Jesus, said when you were in your womb, I knew you. God knew you. And what God teaches in His Word is He's the spark of life. Whenever you become impregnated, ladies, men, you're not going to be impregnated, okay? You're going to really have to work at it hard and get somebody to inject something between your stomach and your skin and, and then really fertilize it good to try to make it good. You know, they've done that before and actually made a baby grow in a man's skin within it, you know. But no, you can't get impregnated. But you do impregnate, right? And you have a part of it. But let me tell you something, it's not your sperm and her egg. You can put those together all day and you won't make a baby. God has to put that spark of life and all life comes from God, okay? God puts that into that egg at that moment and it begins to multiply. And right there is when life begins, okay? That's whenever that little one becomes a person. If you could be aware of it, you can't really even be aware of it at that point, but if you could be, you could go ahead and name it, okay? Because it's not an it anymore. It's a little boy or it's a little girl. Don't give heed to fables. Now the end of the commandment is love. It says charity in the, in the King James, but it means love. Out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In other words, there's people in this world who don't really understand God, but they want to teach God. And that's the false teachers, okay? And I call names sometimes, y'all know the names I call, that people that probably aren't even saved do they use the Bible whenever they give their speeches? Yeah. Do they know what they're talking about? No. How do you know when they're not dividing the word of truth properly? Same thing I've told you up to now. You're reading your Bible, you're studying your Bible, you're understanding who God is, His thoughts, His ways, His character. And if it's contrary to God's character, it's not there. God did not destroy two cities in the Old Testament just out of a whim. He didn't do it because uh, they weren't making sacrifices. He didn't do it because they were worshiping other gods. He did it because they were abusing themselves sexually, women with women and men with men. And folks, that's what we call homosexuality today, and it's a sin. Now, should we love the homosexual person. Yes, that's what Paul said right here. Out of charity you love the sinner, but you hate what? The sin. And you try to, as much as you can, love that person and educate them, reprove them with the Word of God, with, with meekness and fear, and get them to understand that it's contrary to God. And the first step of that is what? What's the very first step working with any unsaved person? Notice I said unsaved person. What would you say, Clint? Salvation. Salvation. If a man's not saved or a woman's not saved, they will never understand God. They can't. They are blinded. And they've got those scales of blindness on their eyes because of Adam's sin and because of her own sin nature. And they need to hear the gospel and know that Jesus loves them. And we've got to show them that. But once they're saved, they need to learn the truth of the Word of God. And we need, out of love, to share with them and help them to grow. 
Now sometimes you do have to get a little stiff, firm with them, just like our kids. You know, sometimes you started out and say, if you don't stop that now, I'm going to put you in time out. Right? And you put them in time out for five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, depending on how old they are. Do you think you can behave yourself now? Okay, you got a time out. They go right back and do the same thing again. What do you do that time? You put them in a longer time out, or you take something away from them, or it progresses and progresses and progresses until it gets to the highest point in my book, and I spank my boys, and I'd do it now if I had young ones. I spank my grandkids. They call it puck-a-puck. -puck. Where they got that from, I don't know. But if you don't stop that, Pap's going to have to puck a puck. You know, every one of them will reach back there and cover their rears, you know, and, and walk away. But you have to get harder and harder. And sometimes with the born again child of God, we have to do that. And the scripture tells us that if a person, whenever you go to them one on one and they won't hear and they won't learn, and we're talking about a saved person that can understand, then you take someone with you. And if that doesn't work, then you bring them before the church and let the church uh, share with them this is not right, this is wrong, you know, uh, the, the totality of the, the body of Christ. And if that doesn't work, you put them out. You put them away from the body of Christ and you give them over to Satan, the scripture says, for the saving of their soul. The whole idea is not to punish them real bad, but hopefully they'll see the error of their ways with that hard judgment. And they'll turn and come to Christ and grow and learn in Him. That's what Paul's teaching Timothy here. And he's sharing that you need to do that. You've got to know the Word of God. You've got to affirm the Word of God in your heart. You've got to live what you know. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, now listen to what Paul says here. The law was not made for righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinner, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my, has committed to my trust. In other words, law, the Old Testament law, is, is not for the righteous, okay? The righteous are the born-again children of God. We've got the law of God in our hearts by way of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to be controlled by the Old Testament law. Well, what's the Old Testament law good for then? That we might know God. That we might know who He is. So the Holy Spirit can take that knowledge and understanding and help us to live righteously. And what is righteousness? Is putting on the right clothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank Christ our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see there? I'd, I was blind. I was unsaved. I didn't know I was doing wrong. I was doing it ignorantly. But God gave me salvation. He saved me out of it. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice that again. Through salvation, God shows his love. It's through that love. This is a faithful saying and a worthy of all acceptation, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. chief. Howbeit for this cause... I obtain mercy that in me first, now I want you to hear this verse, mark it in your Bible, verse 16. How be it, for this cause, what cause? Jesus came and he saved me. 
I obtain mercy that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to eternal life. Why has God shown you the mercy of salvation and the growth in the word of God whenever you, you work for it and get it from the word of God? So that you might be an example to others. What's the very first witness that anyone has to anyone else in this world? It's the way we walk, the way we talk, how we make decisions and decisions we make, how we live, what we believe. They watch us. You're the only gospel a lot of people will ever see. And they won't hear so much what you say, but they'll see what you do and the way you walk and the way you talk. You're writing a gospel, a chapter each day by the things that you do and the things that you say. And the little poem asks, say, what's the gospel according to you? What is your gospel that you're giving the world around you? Paul closes out his introduction, and that's what this was. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Lifting up and praising God. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good, a good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwrecked, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, learn from the ones that fall that you don't need to do that. That's the charge. Pastor Townsend leaves a charge with you, sons and daughters. Commit yourselves, commit your lives to living for the one and only true God, high and lifted up, pure and holy. Be a peculiar people. Live different from the world around you. Read the Word of God. Understand the Word of God. Know the principles of God, the character of God, and take that upon yourself and live that way so that the people that God brings into your venue, your, your world, He might speak to them. Not only through your lips, we need that. Be ready to give an answer to all that ask of the hope that lies within you. But by your life, they might see the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. You are the king of the universe. As Paul said, you're high and lifted up. And Lord, you desire praise. That's what you created us for. But Lord, we've got to somehow get to the world and get them to understand that you came through Jesus Christ and you paid the sin penalty that we might be bought back and we might once again become the creature that you created for that praise and worship. And in doing so, we receive so much, Lord, that you open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing, not only in this world, but the world to come. You take care of us, and we thank you, and we glorify you. Now, Father, speak to hearts this morning, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen.